Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 1 to 16. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed those who are ill or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals. And because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. If you're a regular to our weekly services and sermons, you will know as we've been making our way through the book of Ezekiel, how difficult his message was for people to hear. He's spoken to a displaced people longing for home and he's told them that going home is not an option. He's spoken to them about the city that they love, but he's brought a pretty difficult narrative, one of siege and famine and invasion and destruction by fire. And he's taken an honest and revealing look at the religious life of God's people. And he's exposed corruption and falsehood and self-interest and abuse of power. So Ezekiel is not somebody that you are likely to go out of your way to sit next to if you're going out for a meal. Because he kind of had this habit of just telling the blunt and the difficult truth with very little apparent concern for the sensibilities of those who might be listening. But as is the case in, with so many Old Testament prophets, yes, he reveals some difficult and frankly shameful realities, but he also brings a message of hope. 
And as we have now shot forward into chapter 34, we now begin our journey towards that message of hope. In fact, we hear echoes of that message of hope here. And as we shall discover next week, it comes to a pretty inspiring and rich conclusion. But you may remember too, that we've also been able to draw some parallels between Ezekiel's writings and oracles and those of the New Testament writer John in the book of Revelation, but also in the Gospel of John, in the way that Jesus is presented. And as we delve more fully, fully into chapter 34, this will, yet again, reveal itself to be the case. And you may remember that when we briefly reflected on God's message to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which was mediated through John and kind of again carried some echoes of Ezekiel's message, there was a kind of double-sidedness or a double edge to what he had to say. I have seen what's going on, says God. And to those who struggled and suffered, this was a message of reassurance and encouragement. But to those who'd acted poorly or abandoned their true calling, then this would be a somewhat disturbing thing to hear. And in many respects, we see that same double-edgedness, so to speak, in this particular oracle of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel draws on what is probably the most common metaphor of leadership and authority that we have in the Bible. The image of a shepherd. One that, perhaps not surprisingly, has already featured in our service today as we used for our opening hymn the words of that well-known passage of scripture, the 23rd Psalm believed to be written by the ancient king of Israel, David, who himself had spent his early years working as a shepherd and so often spoke of his kingship in the language of being a shepherd to the people. But as Ezekiel reflects on those who have served as monarchs and rulers of God's people since, he offers a pretty damning verdict on their endeavours. You've been false shepherds, he says. You've failed in your responsibilities and you will be removed. And God himself will shepherd the people. And you can see how that is something of a sort of double-edged message. Because this is good news with a real air of hope. If you're one of those who has found yourself victims of much of this wrongdoing. If you're one of those sheep who has been suffered and left to be scattered. But if you're one of the perpetrators, then this is a deeply uncomfortable message. And God is pretty thorough and all-embracing in his condemnation of these shepherds. He catalogues their shortcomings as he highlights the way that they've abused the flock. They've served their own ends while neglecting the well-being of those they should have been serving. Their failure to care for the vulnerable, to bind up the broken and wounded, to create and maintain what we might call today social cohesion. And frankly, they've created around themselves a regime of brutality and cruelty. And of course, Ezekiel is living with the physical consequences of that. You know, the, the image of the flock being scattered is often just used as a metaphor in God's word to sort of describe a more general breakdown of society and well-being. But in Ezekiel's case, they had quite literally been scattered with no one seemingly able to bring the people back. And so we might take a moment to pause here and simply recognise something of God's concern for our world and the fullness of human experience just in the way that all this is recorded. You know, we often use the metaphor of shepherd to describe those in leadership within the church. And yes, those of us in religious leadership would do well to heed the message of Ezekiel in the way that we go about our task. But this is a message to the political leaders of the day too. And although it's directed at the leaders of Israel, it actually has a much broader application because in the previous chapters, Ezekiel has had much to say about the rulers of the other nations. And through these negatives, we begin to build a picture of the positives that God desires, the, the kind of societies that God wants humanity to live in. Those where the vulnerable are protected, where the broken and the wounded are offered healing and care, where the leaders do not serve their own interests, but truly see themselves as servants of the common good. So let's be clear, God is not disinterested in the affairs of state or the economic systems that we create and maintain. 
And most of all, God is not indifferent to their impact on the people who are affected by them. But I think it is important that we still recognise that this is a message of hope. Because in terms of his condemnation of the people's rulers, Ezekiel is not saying anything new here. His forerunner, the prophet Jeremiah, has already pronounced a very similar verdict on the kings and rulers of the day. And you can read about that in Jeremiah chapter 23, which we think was written a couple of decades earlier. But it's couched in very similar language. You have failed as shepherds and you will be replaced. But the big development in Ezekiel's message is that it is God himself who will step in. It is God himself who will come to the people's rescue. And we read about that from verse 12 onwards. I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from the places where they're scattered. I myself will tend the sheep. I will pastor them. I will search for the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. And in this startling chapter, we recognise both the wrath of God as he condemns those who have failed in their duty, failed those under their care, but we also see the tenderness of God as he speaks of his love and his concern for those who have been so shattered by their experience. And even amidst those words of tenderness, though, there's this rather difficult final statement, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. Now, many versions of the Bible, they translate these with words like fat and overfed, because it's pretty clear that what God has in mind here is not the vengeful slaughter of the healthy, because that's already been condemned in the opening part of this chapter. And I'm sure that you've kind of recognised by now that there's a kind of mirroring going on in the text, that all the things that the earthly rulers have been condemned for neglecting or committing are now being rectified through God's loving care. So it's pretty clear that what God has in his sights here are those rulers who have fed their own interests at the expense of those in their care, that he will bring down those rulers from their thrones, to quote the words of Mary at the beginning of Luke's Gospel. And yes, I've brought the words of Mary in here, because if you haven't noticed it already, here again, in the writing of Ezekiel, we are seeing a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus. And this is something that we seem to discover every time we dip into the writings of this Old Testament prophet. He has a vision of God that resembles a vision that came to a New Testament apostle. There is a physical enactment of God making himself the sacrifice and bearing upon himself the sins of his people. There's the glory of God departing from the city and then being found outside the city walls amidst the suffering and the brutality of the world's plots and power structures. And today, we're confronted with a depiction of God that Jesus would later quite openly and literally use to describe himself. I am the good shepherd, Jesus announces in John chapter 10. The thief comes to destroy and scatter, but the good shepherd comes to lay down his life for the sheep. And Jesus tells stories of sheep that are lost and a shepherd who tirelessly and lovingly seeks and finds them and brings them back to the fold. I will become the good shepherd, says God, through the writings of Ezekiel. I have become the good shepherd, says Jesus, through the writings of John. And I think the connection between the two is pretty clear. But what does all of this say to us as we seek to make sense of our present and to look to the future? Well, again, I'd invite you to look into the detail here, and in particular, the way in which the shortcomings of these rulers, or indeed the acts of restoration that God would accomplish, are so thoroughly catalogued. The broken, the wounded, the displaced, the abused, the hungry, the troubled. And we see something of the fullness of God's concern for humanity as we hear this overarching message coming out. People matter. And this might be a moment to recognise again the historic context into which God is speaking through Ezekiel. There are huge political upheavals going on. 
there are massive military threats. You know, Ezekiel and his fellow exiles are themselves exile, uh, evidence of the challenges that are being faced by the rulers of the day. But God cuts through all of that and he focuses on people and he evaluates the rulers of the people, those who were called to be an example to the other nations, not on the basis of how they've handled the military threat or the economic challenge. In fact, God has said to them time and time again, leave those things to me, focus on the people, focus on their spiritual and physical well-being. Look after my people. And let's just pause, if we may, and take on another important principle here. Look again at the way in which God repeatedly places himself in the picture through what Ezekiel has to say. My sheep have wandered over the mountains, he says in verse 6. My flock lacks a shepherd, in verse 8. My shepherds did not search. Yes, even your earthly authority, he says to the rulers, is not something that you own, but something that I've granted you. You are my rulers. And he carries on. I will rescue my flock. I will look after my sheep. And we're reminded here that every one of us, no matter how large or small our spheres of influence might be, we are not owners of all that we survey, free to do as we please. We're stewards of what God has entrusted to our care. And in recent years, we've been brought face to face with the cumulative effect of a world community that has seen itself as owners and consumers of God's creation, rather than stewards who've been entrusted to look after it. And as world leaders and activists gather later this year for the COP climate conference, some are asking whether it is already too late to undo the harm that we've inflicted on this planet. And as our services together have continued week by week, at times we've struggled to keep up in our prayers of intercession with the catalogue of wildfires and floods and landslides that are the ever increasing evidence of this climate emergency. Even as we're still reeling from the news that came out of Central Europe last week, we're now hearing of equally cataclysmic floods going on in China. And that's before we even mention what we've learned through the emergence and impact of COVID-19. And what we're reminded of again and again is that it's people who are harmed when these things happen. It's people whose lives are lost and whose well-being is shattered by these events. And God speaks to us again and again and says, people matter. It's people, not economic systems or military power or political expediency that needs to guide the actions of our nations, but the well-being of people. Unless we simply package this up and heap this as criticism on those who hold political office, let's recognise again that every one of us has influence. Every one of us has been entrusted in some way or other with the care of God's creation. And so, Let's particularly reflect on how we might respond to this message that people matter. How we, as those who believe that the promise made known through Ezekiel of a good shepherd come to rescue suffering humanity, was fulfilled through Jesus. How we, as those who believe ourselves to be commissioned to continue the work that he began and to proclaim the message that he came to declare, how we should act in the light of what God says here. You know, a few weeks ago, we sent out a survey to all of our NWBA churches and ministries trying to discover something of how we'd been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you were one of those people that filled that in, thank you very much for your efforts and your support. And it was great that such a large number of people did respond. And we were asking those kind of questions. What lessons had we learned? What difference might it make to our future? What new priorities had emerged or what long-standing priorities had we reaffirmed through what's taken place? And if there is one overwhelming message that came back from the many and varied answers that we received to the many and varied questions, it was that people matter. When we asked about what had been learned, when we asked about what had been missed, when we asked churches what their concerns and hopes were for the future, when we asked people what their priorities should be, when we asked people what we should be helping them with, the one thread that was woven through a whole variety of answers was that people matter. And I hope that we might draw some confidence 
and dare I say courage from that. Confidence, because in responding to the events unfolding around us, we have echoed what God spoke time and time again through his prophets. But courage, because I would suggest that for all of that realisation, I recognise too, both within myself and also within many of the responses that we received, that we do still tend to drift towards a way of thinking that our primary concern needs to be to keep the structures and the programmes and the activities in place, rather than allowing the needs of people to determine our priorities. And I think we might do well to just inhabit the image of those failing shepherds and God's commitment made real in Jesus to become the good shepherd. Because if you go back to some of the earlier prophets, people like Isaiah, we begin to pick up the same message. You know, let's not pretend for a minute that these ancient kings of Israel were not facing some pretty real and difficult pressure with all the needs and expectations of people bearing down on them from every side. You know, they could see the military threats that surrounded them. They could see what had happened in some of the neighbouring territories. And we might not be surprised to, that they sought to make alliances and treaties as a way of shoring up their regimes. But God said, don't do that. Care for my people. And Jesus, centuries later, as we have observed on more than one occasion in these services, when he came and shared his message, he was confronted with those who wanted to shore up the structures. The Pharisees, who wanted to see the moral codes of religion restored and, if anything, intensified. The Sadducees, who wanted to see the ceremonial and the festal aspects of their faith restored. The Herodians, who believed that it was the political structures that were crucial. But when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, or when Jesus saw a crowd coming together at the shore of a lake, he saw people. He describes them as like sheep without a shepherd. And even amongst his disciples after his death and resurrection, they wanted the kingdom restored. But Jesus says, no, just go into the world and tell people that my kingdom is within their grasp already. Earlier on in his ministry, before his death, when the women brought the children for Jesus to bless, no, said the disciples, he mustn't be interrupted. Don't disrupt the preaching program. And Jesus just puts everything on hold and he brings the children to the centre and he blesses them because people matter. And when Jesus sees those whose condition causes disdain and revulsion amongst most, he is moved with compassion to the very core of his being because in God's eyes, people matter. And in many respects, we have now reached that place where we, battered, bruised and broken sheep, are beginning to come back together and were bruised and battered and broken sheep are desperate in their need to be reclaimed and bound up and cared for. And as we look again at the catalogue of condemnation at the beginning of this chapter, which is then mirrored by an equivalent but even more fulsome outlining of the extent and the breadth of God's care, we recognise how complete and holistic God's concern for people truly is. And as Jesus spoke of himself as the good shepherd, he spoke of gathering those from many folds into a new community of love and care. The good shepherd was not interested in what he could gain from the sheep, but what he could give to them. The good shepherd wasn't concerned with the plans and programs of his enterprises, but the condition and the needs of the flock. And if recent events have taught us that people matter, then all they've really done is brought hope to us what God has been saying to his people, either through similar events or through his word that's endured through every generation for centuries. People matter. And of course, while that includes their physical and their emotional well-being, let's not forget that the good shepherd of whom we believe Ezekiel to have been speaking came to bring spiritual restoration and eternal salvation as Jesus. And I guess that the question that emerges as our life together as church communities does become increasingly released from restriction is are we ready to become a church where people truly matter? 
Are we ready to become a church that does not condemn those who are strayed and scattered, but sees itself as responsible for drawing them back? Are we prepared to be a church who sacrifice our own interests for the sake of those that God might entrust to our care? Are we prepared to be a church that do not see ourselves as owning the show, but as stewards of that which is God's? Are we ready to become a church that reflects in every aspect of its life the concerns of the Good Shepherd and the presence of the Good Shepherd at its very heart? My prayer is that God will help us together to become that church. Amen. Mm -hmm.